it's a great honor to be here, uh, to be amongst friends, even although we are dispersed. Not so long ago, the economic questions requiring urgent attention could be studied by excluding nature from formal economic reasoning. As it made sense to focus on the accumulation of produced capital, roads, buildings, ports, machines, and human capital, health and education. The reason is that at the end of the Second World War, Europe was devastated, the Far East was devastated, they needed reconstruction, and soon after, num large numbers of countries became independent of colonial rule, and the idea of economic development loomed large, and it was but natural to think in terms of the accumulation of produced capital and human capital, and keeping nature at a distance. Unfortunately, the resulting macroeconomic models of growth and development so directed the way economists in academia, national governments, and international organizations collect and analyze data today, that it has become a commonplace that we can bypass nature in our economic lives. This is a profound error. Nature is our home. She is our most precious asset. The belief that we can bypass nature has been strengthened by the fact that the average person today enjoys a far higher income is less likely to be in absolute poverty and lives significantly longer than she did even 70 years ago. That's the end of the Second World War, or a few years after. Since 1950, the global expectancy of life at birth has risen from 46 years to 73 years. The world economy has grown more than 15-fold to over $130 trillion GDP a year at purchasing power parity. Global per capita income has increased more than fivefold to over $17,000, again, at purchasing power parity. And there are 5.3 billion more people today to enjoy that increase. For a world population today, is 7.8 billion. It would seem then that we are living in the very best of times. And indeed, large numbers of books are routinely written to express that jubilation. But even while we have enjoyed the fruits of economic growth, the demands we have made of nature's goods and services have for some decades exceeded her ability to supply them on a sustainable basis. Because the difference between demand and sustainable supply is met by a degradation of nature, the gap has been increasing, threatening our descendants' lives. We have been collectively damaging nature at an alarming rate with biodiversity declining faster than at any time in human history and even before. It's almost like we're like a crowd of people on a hanging bridge trying to keep balance and then bringing it down crashingly. By one inevitably very crude estimate, the ratio of demand to sustainable supply is today approximately 1.6, which provides the image that we need 1.6 Earths to meet our current demands. It would seem then that we are also living at the worst of times. Nature is an asset, like produced capital and human capital. But like education and health, nature is not merely an economic good. We all rely on goods and services nature supplies, and my review goes into this, the ecological and environmental science of the matter in great detail. But nature's worth goes beyond its use value. Aspects of it have intrinsic, even sacred value. Moreover, we are embedded in nature. We are not external to her. Once we include these aspects of nature in our lives, the economics of biodiversity becomes a study in portfolio management. This too should be of no surprise, for we are all asset managers, whether as farmers or fishermen, foresters or miners, households or firms, governments or charities, we each manage our assets in line with our motivation and the constraints we face. So then why are we collectively failing to manage our global portfolio of assets a central reason is that nature's worth to society is not reflected in market prices. Nature is mobile, she is silent, and she is invisible often. Just think of what's going on under our feet in what's known as a pedosphere, i.e. in the soils, and you'll get the sense of what I mean. It is hard to trace the consequences, often deleterious consequences, 
of human actions to those who are responsible for them. That makes it very hard for markets to function well. But it isn't simply a case of market failure. It is broadly an institutional failure. Our institutions have been unable to create the necessary in incentives for us to economize our use of nature's fundamental services. The open oceans and the atmosphere are global public goods. We all benefit from it. We use the, the, use, we use the former for fishing and for transportation, but don't pay rent for that use. And we use the latter as a sink for our carbon emissions, and yet we don't pay a price for emissions. Worse, government subsidized the use of nature to the extent of some four to six trillion US dollars annually. That's five to 7% of global GDP. In effect, we pay ourselves to exploit rather than protect our home. So we need a transformative change to correct for the imbalance. The review identifies three broad transitions that are needed, and I'm going to list them in the, what remains of my time. Firstly, we need to address the imbalance between our demands on nature and its supply. On the one hand, this means setting ambitious global targets for meaningful conservation and restoration and invest more in nature to increase the quantity and quality of our stocks of natural assets. Those are means of, for increasing, there are means of, for increasing productivity of nature. On the other hand, we need to remove those subsidies so as to reduce the demands we make on nature because they'll become more costly to use. The latter includes expansion of foreign aid in the form of family planning and reproductive services to developing regions that are yet far from enjoying fertility transition. We also need devices to, to restructure our consumption and production patterns and to further reduce our demands on nature. One such device would be the requirement that firms disclose the characteristics of their entire supply chain from source to sink. Disclosure is a substitute for imperfect markets. The review goes into great detail into why, what the logic underlying the need for disclosure is. Secondly, we need to change our measures of economic success, a point that has been raised before today. While GDP is indispensable in short-run macroeconomic analysis, it does not account for the depreciation of assets and is therefore wholly unsuitable for identifying how to develop sustainably. Governments and business Businesses alike need to routine, uh, routinize natural capital accounting. This will serve as a critical step towards making inclusive wealth. Uh, and by that, I mean the sum of our produced human and natural capital, the value of them, are key measure of progress. Private companies produce balance sheets to augment their income expenditure accounts. So too, national governments should produce balance sheets to augment their income expenditure accounts. Finally, we must transform our institutions, particularly our financial and educational systems, to enable those changes to take place at a global scale. Both public and private financial actors have a role to play in re reorienting financial flows towards enhancing our natural assets, and far more support is needed to improve awareness among businesses and financial institutions of their dependencies, impacts, and risks associated with the degradation of nature. Let me give you one example of the institutional changes that the review suggests. At the end of the Second World War, the, global, the, the, the community of nations had the courage of conviction to establish the World Bank, the IMF, and we now have other institutions like the WHO, FAO, which are responsible for managing global public goods. We now need desperately an international institution with the authority to monitor and manage global public goods like the open seas for which we do not pay anything and the ocean uh, and the atmosphere. However, as much of as beca because much of nature is silent and invisible, institutions cannot be expected to eliminate all of the negative impacts of our activities have on nature. Citizens therefore have to serve both as judge and jury for their own actions. Citizens need to be empowered not only to demand the changes that are needed in our demands on nature, and many of those demands are at the local level, but also to make informed decisions about their own individual impact on the natural environment. And that cannot happen without enabling individuals, above all through educational policy, to understand and appreciate the workings of the natural world. That's the conclusion in the sense that because nature is silent, mobile, and invisible, 
you, no institution can manage to monitor what we do to it. We each has to be our judge and jury. And the educational suggest the suggestions that the view concludes, right, that we all need to become in part naturalists. And the only way we can is to begin the earlier stages of our lives to learn something about this wonderful the home we live in. And to love something, you require an understanding. And understanding, of course, is the basis for science. Thank you very much.